Yeah, uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm super happy to present here. Uh, just real quick, I do want to mention that the results that I'm going to talk about today are kind of joint works with Felix Young and Young Zhou. That's one of the papers. And then I also have some joint works with Rachel Webb. Um, so I'll point them out as we go through. But yeah, so I'm going to be talking about Gromov wind theory of non-convex complete intersections. And every time I give a Gromov wind theory talk, uh, I always am a little bit concerned on who knows the Gromov wind theory, who doesn't. So I kind of made a cheat sheet of some basic definitions in Gromov wind theory. Um, in particular, my talk is going to revolve around orbital Gromov wind theory, so it does involve stacks, um, and I'll be using that language throughout. Um, but the idea is a so you essentially have a modulized space of maps from curves to a target space. And in this case, your curves are going to have a specified genus and a specified number of mark points. This is denoted MGN, X beta. In orbital Gromov wind theory, my target X is going to be normally a delete Mumford stack. Um, and the curves that I have in these maps are also going to be delete Mumford stacks, but I'm going to require that they only have a non-trivial stack structure at the markings. So if you're not super familiar with stacks, the idea is you can think of uh, having a curve and some mark points on it. And at the mark points, you can just think that they carry some type of data of some finite group, some finite abelian group. So in this case, maybe B mu three or mu three, a group with three elements in it. Um, so there's also some other requirements that you want to impose on these curves. Uh, the first is that usually you denote a degree that these maps have. Um, if you take the push order from the mental class, it equals some degree beta. And you also want some kind of stability conditions. Uh, just to make sure that the stack is Dilly Mumford or nice enough to really work with. So usually you kind of impose that the maps have a finite amount of automorphisms to it. And then finally, this is kind of particular to orbifold Gromov wind theory, is that you really require your maps to be representable. This is a technical condition um, about stacks. Uh, I don't think I will get into it, but if you know, then I, I, I will have all my morphisms be representable throughout the talk. Okay, so now you have this moduli stack and you have these morphisms, but from this moduli stack, you actually also have evaluation maps that basically evaluate your, uh, your functions F, your morphisms F at the marked points. So EVI would be evaluating F at the ith marked point. Unlike uh, kind of the scheme version of Gromov wind theory, the target of these evaluation morphisms is not uh, X itself, but it's actually the inertia stack of X. So this is kind of a gadget that appears in the stack theory. It's another stack associated to X, and you can think of it as basically parameterizing points of X, as well as kind of this isotropy data um, given by the stacky structure, as you know, this being an example. So your evaluation morphisms don't land in X, they land in I of X, or the inertia stack of X. That's another kind of large difference in order for Gromov wind theory. And because of that, essentially um, in Gromov wind theory, you want to work with cohomology of the target space, so cohomology of X. And usually the idea is that you're going to pull back cohomology classes using these evaluation morphisms. But because now your target is the inertia stack of X, you actually need to change your cohomology from the you know, singular cohomology of X itself to what is now known as the Chenron cohomology of X. So as non-graded groups, the Chenron cohomology of X is just the cohomology of the inertia stack. Um, so every kind of cohomology class in the inertia stack will give you a cohomology class in the Chenron, Chenron cohomology. However, there is a lot of complications of how the ring structure is defined and uh, how the grading is defined. And it's more complicated to discuss. I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave that to examples, kind of point out gradings later. Um, but, you know, I guess for purposes, uh, if you're if you're wondering when I talk about products or when I talk about grading, it's always going to be with respect to this Chenron grading or this Chenron ring structure. And then lastly, I'm going to define what a Gromov wind invariant is. Uh, like I said before, what you want to do is you have these evaluation morphisms from your modulized stack to your target, and you want to pull back 
cohomology classes using these evaluation morphisms, and then you integrate them on your moduli stack. So normally we kind of use this bracket notation to denote a grimov witten variant, where you input different cohomology classes, these gamma i's, which are in the cohomology of x. So again, in the Chen-Ron cohomology of x for the orbifold situation, you pull them back using your evaluation morphisms, you take the product of all of them, and then you integrate them over the moduli stack. One funny business is that we actually integrate over something known as a virtual stack, or a virtual fundamental class. Um, this is because the moduli space itself is not super nice. And the virtual cycle is a cycle that lives in the chow ring of your uh, moduli stack, but is kind of what you want your moduli stack to be rather than what it actually is. Kind of if your moduli stack was the ideal niceness, then this is what you have. Um, again, it's a technical condition, but really just think pulling back onto the moduli stack, integrating on the moduli stack, and if the classes are the right degrees, you're going to get a number afterwards. Okay, so that's orbifold Gromov wind theory. And uh, now I'm going to explain what I mean by uh, non convex or convexity. So this kind of relates to a theorem that is known as quantum Lefschetz. And the setup is as follows. Um, I should start by saying I'm going to assume the genus is zero throughout this talk, uh, the genus of the curves. So, yeah, I could talk about high genus later if needed, but um, really uh, everything's going to be a genus zero situation. So, before I describe quantum left shifts, the kind of setup that I want to look at is as follows. I want to consider Y as some um, uh, stack or Deline Mumford stack or scheme, if you're more comfortable with that. And then what I want to do is I want to take a split vector bundle over y. So a vector bundle that splits into a sum of line bundles. And then you can take a section of this vector bundle and look at the vanishing of a generic section. And if you do that, you'll get some kind of substack called x. And so we talk about the vector bundle e being convex if I look at um, all stable maps from genus zero curve C mapping into Y. And if I pull back E onto the curve and then look at the H1 of that bundle, uh, this is zero for all stable maps. So this is a technical condition on the cohomology. It's needed uh, to, well, I guess it's needed in the proof of what uh, is now classically known as quantum Lefschetz. And basically what quantum Lefschetz says is that if you look at the moduli stack of morphisms to X and you look at the moduli stack of morphisms to Y, then you can compare the two by, you know, you can take, you can take them, the virtual cycle on X. You can post compose all your maps, like from a curve to X to Y just by the inclusion. And so you have this kind of natural inclusion that you can push forward your moduli, your virtual cycle of maps on X uh, with. And the after you push forward, this will look like the virtual cycle of Y, but twisted or capped with some Euler class of a vector bundle associated to E. This vector bundle right here is on the moduli stack. It's related to E. It's given by kind of pulling back and onto the universal curve of the moduli stack and pushing forward. Uh, but Essentially, there's, there's a relation between the two virtual cycles. So the upshot of this kind of quantum Lefschetz theorem um, is essentially that if you want to compute gromov wind variants of X, this kind of uh, complete intersection hypersurface or this vanishing of this section, then the way you compute it, or one way you can compute it if you have convexity, is that you can actually compute it in terms of the gromov wind variants of Y twisted by some extra class. And this isn't so much of a big deal computationally. Generally speaking, the idea is that um, X might be more complicated than Y. The ambient, uh, ambient space might have a lot more structure. And kind of this twisting is a lot easier to deal with sometimes than actually just working with X itself. So what I want to highlight is uh, what convexity kind of feels like uh, for schemes versus orbifolds. And this is going to bring up some of the issues that happen in orbifold gromov wind theory. So for schemes, if you have a bundle that's convex, you can really rephrase this into some type of positivity condition. Um, 
So essentially, E being convex, you can just ask that these line bundles that it splits into are all positive with the chosen degree. Um, so it's, it's not very difficult to see. I mean, for example, if you take y equal to projective space, then really I'm just asking all the y line bundles to be like O of n, where n is a positive number. And so this is super simple to check. Um, it's actually probably the generic case that you care about will be convex, at least in genus zero. And so everything is great. But if X is an orbital fold, this is uh, no longer a true condition. So this is a paper by um, six authors. It's, and I'm sorry if I miss one of the names, but it's Coates, Gopamar, Iratani, Jiang, Johnson, and Manolash. I think I got them all, but if I did, then I'm sorry. <laughs> But yeah, six authors, it's a, it's a relatively short paper, but it pretty clearly highlights the point that if you want a bundle to be convex in the orbital fold setting, it's actually a very restrictive assumption. And you can show that it's kind of equivalent to this bundle being pulled back from this coarse moduli space or the underlying scheme associated to the stack. So this does not happen very often. And this is kind of the, you know, not ideal situation to be in. Uh, as an example, we can just, again, look at projective space, but now I look at a weighted projective stack. So think of projective space, but my coordinates now have different weights to it, maybe weights W0 to WN. Um, so this stack, I can, again, take a line bundle on it and it's Z graded. So my line bundles can be described as like O of N for some N in Z. But now the equivalent condition to really kind of asking for this to be convex is that these this uh, n has to be divisible by the GCD of W0 to Wn. And this is kind of, you know, a hard ask. Most n are not like this. And so you're not going to generically expect convexity to be true for orbital folds. So a big issue of this is then that a lot of the proofs that work for schemes don't really translate for um, these cases in orbifold. So all these proofs that use quantum left just for schemes. And this is you know, very important for some very classical theorems in the field. So the biggest example I will say is um, you can think of the quintic uh, inside of P4, and then you can look at the genus zero theory of this. This was done by Givental and also by Lian, Liu, and uh, Yao. And essentially, at least with Givental's proof, it was kind of crucial that you can relate the invariance, the genus zero invariance of the quintic, to the genus zero invariance of P4. And part of that was because P4 has a lot more structure. It's a toric variety. You have a nice C star action on P4, and you can use a lot of nice computational techniques, such as localization, to compute the invariance. And so, um, you know, even in this classical example, we see quantum methods being used, and an equivalent formulation in orbital folds would not have that uh, available. So the main goal of the kind of research that is being presented here is that we want to find a way to compute invariance for complete intersections when convexity fails. Like, how do we do it if we no longer have a convex bundle? And so the assumption I'm going to give for the talk is that we're going to look at Calabia three folds instead of weighted projective stacks. Um, the results of the talk work more generally for toric stacks and any complete intersection in toric stacks, but Calabia threefolds are typically what most people care about numerically, so it's of high interest, and weighted projective stacks are easy enough stacks to understand, even if you're not very familiar with the Lima for stacks. So the setup for Calabia threefold and weighted projective stack is that we have some bundle that has uh, that's given by the sum of the weights in terms of the Picard group, and you have some generic section of that. It'll cut out a Calabial threefold uh, inside of the weighted projective stack. So this is the case of a hypersurface, but you could think of a Calabial complete intersection as well. Okay, so the main kind of theory that we use to kind of approach this work is what is known as quasi-map theory. Quasi-map theory is a theory that was kind of more formalized in the 2010s, early 2010s onwards. Um, and the idea is so if 
you have a affine variety W and you have a reductive group G acting on W as well as a character of G, then you can classically form the GIT quotients of W with respect to the action of G. And so normally what you do is you form the GIT quotient, but now you can actually form two different stacks associated to it. The first is the GIT stack quotient. This is where you remove the unstable locus, just like in GIT theory, and then you take a stack quotient. So it's a quotient where you're now kind of effectively remembering a lot of the um, stabilizer data coming from the group. So you're going to get a proper you're going to get a proper delete number stack out of this. And then the second stack you can take is where you just quotient by the action of G without any removal of unstable data. And this is what I'll call the ambient stack, just colloquially, I guess. Um, but this guy is generally going to be an Arden stack. It's not going to be the lean Mumford, and it's kind of hard to work with. Um, but it exists. And you have this natural inclusion of the lean Mumford stack into the kind of ambient quotient stack just from the fact that the um, kind of affine locus for the GIT for the GIT stack naturally includes. Okay, so I, I do briefly want to mention this note that I have here. Uh, if you are familiar with quasi-map theory, there's usually an LCI assumption that is floating around for the affine variety. Uh, you don't actually need that LCI assumption. You can still get a perfect obstruction theory by removing it. So for those who know, uh, I'm not going to be assuming LCI for my affine scheme, and it's actually necessary to remove the LCI assumption for some of the constructions later. But anyway, let's get into kind of what is quasi-map theory. Uh, quasi-map theory essentially is now when I look at maps with curves to my space, um, the target that I care about is this GIT quotient. So I want X to be my GIT quotient, but when I look at the morphism, I actually want my morphism to be a map to the ambience stack quotients instead. So I'm looking at C mapping into the Arden stack. And then I impose an addition that if you look at the kind of locus of points that lands in the Arden stack, but not the GIT stack sitting inside of it, I want this to be a zero dimensional scheme. And I want it to contain none of the markings that are on my curve to begin with. So basically, it's kind of like a map that mostly falls into the target that I want, but a little bit of it spills out into kind of this bigger ambient blob. Okay, so the main idea or the main use for quasi-map theory is that if you allow for these types of almost maps, then you get a family of moduli spaces. Just as before, there were stability conditions for this kind of uh, moduli space of curves. There are now a family of stability conditions parameterized by uh, a parameter epsilon, and epsilon is a positive rational number that's allowed to be infinity. And for each of these uh, stability conditions, I get a moduli space, which I'm going to denote by Q epsilon. So the kind of main thing that we should know about Q epsilon is that if you look at epsilon equals infinity, so epsilon looks very large, the stability condition stabilizes, and what you actually end up getting is the original moduli stack of stable maps. Uh, but on the other side, when I take epsilon super small, this also stabilizes, and this stabilizes into a moduli space where effectively I allow for these quasi maps that I described before. The stability conditions are much more loose there, and really I can have many points fall into my ambient stack quotients. So the big thing is that now that I have this family of moduli spaces, you can talk about relations between the invariance you define via these um, different moduli stacks. You can again, again, you can again define gromov wind invariance in the same way for each of them. And there's a question where if I define gromov wind invariance in the classical way on this kind of infinity side, and I look at the invariance on this kind of zero plus side, how are they related to one another? And the relation between them is something known as epsilon wall crossing. Um, there is, it's actually well known at this point. Um, so we have a good handle of how to kind of transfer invariance over from the zero plus side to the infinity side. Uh, but the big reason you would want to do this is that it turns out that this kind of zero plus moduli space is a lot simpler and a lot easier to work with. 
So um, here's kind of the setup that we're going to end up trying to do here. Uh, on the epsilon infinity equals infinity side, you can define something known as a J function. Um, this is from given Hall's notation, but it's the same idea. It's essentially that you can define a generating series of gromov witten invariants um, on your, uh, yeah, well, it's a generating series of gromov witten invariants where your insertions are kind of T, Q, and Z. T here is a generic element of your cohomology, and this will be the generic element that shows up in the invariants themselves. So you can see right here, T is your generic insertion into your uh, gromov witten invariants in this generating series. Q is something that knows a Novikov variable. It kind of helps keep track of the degree um, beta, and um, I guess I, I don't really want to go into it too much, but you could just think of Q as a formal variable for now. And Z is a, a localization, or Z is a formal variable as well that you can kind of think of as a localization parameter, but we'll just think of them as formal variables. Uh, but yeah, the main upshot is we have a generating series of gremlin weight invariants. And then on the epsilon equals zero side, you can define a similar series, some type of generating series of, um, yes, uh, there's a question, I think. Um, could you say a little bit about what phi lower i and phi upper i are? Ah, sorry. These, these are also cohomology classes. I apologize. So phi i is um, also a cohomology class, and phi upper i is kind of the class that is Poincaré dual to it. So these two are cohomology classes that are Poincaré dual. Um, so I didn't really define what the Poincaré duality is on the um, Chen-Ron cohomology, but there is a uh, non-degenerate um, kind of non-degenerate Poincaré bracket you can define on it. And so these two are kind of dual with respect to each other in that way. Uh, I am also hiding that normally that it J function is a generating series of Gromov invariants of one insertion, normally in them already. And so this is going to be kind of that extra one insertion. Oops. And the Ts are going to be extra insertions that are added afterwards. Um, so this function takes values in cohomology, if I'm reading correctly, yes, or rather in Chenron right. cohomology. Right. Yeah, so th this is the Chenron cohomology value function. That's right. OK. Any other questions? Great. OK, so yeah, I do have uh, this generating series, and I can define it equivalently on the epsilon equals 0 side. So on the epsilon equals 0 side, the thing is that um, there is a way to construct this generating series or compute this generating series instead in a more computational manner. And so I'm going to just call a series that you get from the epsilon equals 0 side this uh, an i function. This is again reminiscent of given tall's i function, but uh, there is a caveat. It's it's not quite defined using the epsilon equals zero moduli space. You do have to do a, a slight variation of that moduli space. But the idea is that this series you can define by localization on a substack of kind of this big Hom stack of. Uh, weighted projective lines mapping into your ambient stack quotient. These weighted projective lines only have one stacky points on them. That's what I usually call infinity, but I guess that's convention. And um, there is a natural C star action on these weighted projective lines that's given by scaling this weight R um, variable, or this kind of weight R coordinate right here. And so there is a way to kind of uh, do what is known as torus localization or in this case, C star localization, it's a way to kind of reduce a lot of uh, integrals into integrals over fixed loci. But maybe the main up point of this is that things can be computed explicitly. If I want to try to compute an I function, I can I can use these localization manners to kind of compute I explicitly. So in quasi map theory, there is a theorem by my co-author uh, co that kind of explains how these two series are related to one another. And effectively, what he says is if you have an I function and you want to compute a J function, the relationship between them is that they're equivalent up to a change of coordinates on this J function. So where you would normally have T, this generic insertion into, into your J function, this generic homology insertion, 
what it ends up being is uh, this new series, mu, of uh, q and z. And what mu is, is it's going to be this positive part of the i function. You kind of, well, OK. I say positive part of the i function. Uh, my convention is you need to multiply by z and then subtract off z and take a positive part. But if you do that, you get some kind of subseries that you then input as your generic insertion. I guess I should have also mentioned the i function is uh, cohomology valued. So this will be a cohomology value series. Yes, question. Could you go back one slide for a moment? Yes. OK, so I think what you're saying, roughly speaking, is that the i function is defined by localization on the something like the moduli space of quasi maps with one parameterized component or something like that. That's right, yes. But I don't, off the top of my head, see why I get, okay, I can't, either I should get all positive powers of z or possibly I should get all negative powers of z and I can't work out which one it is, but I don't understand mm -hmm. why you get both of them. Because in both a minute you have to get both of them. Ah, you mean in this type of part yeah, so here, why do I get like positive exactly. parameters so, in? So implicitly there, you've got a lot of yeah. negative powers of Z and also some positive ones, but I can't see in your almost definition why that's true. Oh, why it's mostly, why it's like a, a bunch of negative Zs. No, no, um, I, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy with there being lots of negative Zs, but at the moment I don't okay. see why there are any positive Zs. Oh, so there doesn't necessarily have to be positive sides is, is part of the issue. So I, I think just like traditionally, for instance, if you take like some kind of a final hypersurface or something like this and you, okay, yeah, okay, uh, maybe, yeah. So the, the idea is the I function is, um, it has like degrees for every parameter and it's quasi homogeneous of degree zero. And it turns out that if you have like very, Fano hypersurfaces or kind of the degree of the tangent bundle is nicely positive, then it's possible that you'd get no positive Zs in your I function term. In that case, then what happens with this mu is that it ends up being zero. Oh, wait, sorry. I think I've understood it now. Okay. Okay, oh, so this is also just... Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think I'm just going yes. to retract my question because I don't think I can. I don't think I can explain it helpfully. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I guess really what I will say is if your if your I function doesn't have like positive powers of z in it, and then you do this kind of um, contraction, normally what ends up happening is your I will always have like a one term in it, and then possibly some negative powers. It may not have any positive powers of Z, but in that case, this will just end up being zero. And so your generic insertion that you're putting into your J function is zero. Um, yeah, hopefully. Right, that, and because it's defined yeah. by localization, there can actually be some positive powers and there will be a lot of the time if, unless I have very positive, some kind of like very strong positive condition. That's right, that's right. So there will be positive power. So for instance, uh, for Clavial things, or even actually we'll see later on, uh, even for, Fondo cases, but if we do some kind of construction on them, or the construction I'll show, there can be positive powers, there can be a lot, and then you get some non trivial insertion into your J function. Okay, so if people are familiar with what I functions look like in the literature, your function that it's called I is just the usual thing. It's just some ratio of hypergeometric function. Sorry, it's just some that's hypergeometric right. type function. Yeah, okay. That, that's that's exactly correct. So if I do this kind of I function construction for schemes, for instance, like let's say I do the quintic in P4, I should recover exactly what given tall has, except for maybe this exponential factor. Sometimes people omit that, sometimes people keep that in. The exponential factor usually comes from divisor equation. Um, but yeah, it will look like a ratio of hypergeometric series. Okay, so uh, one thing I want to point about this wall crossing theorem right now is that we can see that on the J side, the insertion that you get really depends on I. And so it's a little bit, I don't know, it, it's a little bit funny in that you really want to compute a lot of the Grimmel wind variance of X, but depending on what form your I function ends up taking, you may compute some invariance uh, with or invariance of some insertions, you may compute invariance with no insertions, or you may compute invariance with maybe all the insertions you want. So 
there are kind of two questions you can ask. It's, you know, the first one is like, what type of insertions can we obtain from this wall crossing formula? Is there enough control that we can have over this I function in order to get a J function that has multiple invariants in it? Um, and then the second that is a smaller question is that as it's stated, right now this theorem is about generating series and equating to generating series. But if I want to pull out the individual invariants, I kind of want to have a way to rewrite things, not so that J is a change of coordinates, but really that I is a change of coordinates of J. So this is something that's kind of called invertibility, which um, will show up in a bit. Okay, so this is the, like the work with Yang Zhou and Felix Yanga is essentially doing this for torque stacks, uh, complete intersections and torque stacks. Um, and the idea is we first answer what kind of insertions can we obtain in our Bromo win invariants using this kind of wall crossing method. And the invariants that we are able to obtain, obtain or the insertions we're able to obtain are what we call admissible classes. So we have a subring of the Chen Ron cohomology called the admissible state space. And basically the idea is that these are classes that are point prey dual to cycles defined by coordinate hyperplane vanishings. It's a bit funny, but you can take, um, yeah, you can, you can take vanishings of coordinate hyperplanes. These will give you sub stacks within your space. And then you can take point gray duality to get a Chen Ron cohomology class. And those are the ones that we can work with. It, in terms of relating to other um, kind of subrings inside your Chen Ron cohomology ring, it does not necessarily need to be the entire Chen Ron cohomology ring. It could be, but it's not always. However, it does contain all the classes that are known as ambient classes. So these are classes that are pulled back from the weighted projective space to your complete intersection. Um, so normally when people talk about quantum left shift type theorems, really when they end up computing these grow wind variants, they have these ambient classes as the insertions in their grow wind variants. And these admissible classes can sometimes be include more classes than you would want, uh, than you would normally input for a quantum left shift type proof. Um, we'll see an example of this later if we have time. I've written one down, but this is the idea. Uh, it includes everything you would want in quantum left shift type arguments, but it may not be everything. And then kind of the idea that we go through here is uh, we extend the GIT quotient in a very specific way. This is very familiar to uh, these kind of stacky torque fans that were done in past literature. Um, but the main idea here is that the I function computation is actually sensitive to the GIT presentation, but the J function is not. So again, the J function is on this kind of moduli space of maps to the target itself. The curve maps directly into the target, whereas the I function is constructed using maps that can sometimes map outside of the target into this ambient stack quotient. So if you change the GIT presentation, the ambient stack quotient will actually change. And we're going to use this to our advantage to basically get different I functions um, by messing around with parameterization. So what we do is we first specify a basis of admissible classes, and then we construct a new presentation based on those admissible classes, where now we add an extra uh, C star action for every one of the classes in the basis. So here I have M classes. I've now added M extra C star factors. Normally there's one for a way to project the space, but now I have M plus one of them. Uh, you extend the character, but in weighted projective spaces, the extension of the character is pretty trivial. You really just want to extend the character by having the character multiply all the factors together. And then you want to extend the affine scheme that defines your complete intersection. So this is a little bit, it's not so tricky. It's more kind of like you just need to now extend the affine scheme to live in a bigger affine space. Uh, if, for instance, I was just thinking about way to project this space, I would normally have C n plus n plus 1 modulo C star n plus 1. If you just think about kind of a small dimension count, this should be enough to get you back possibly your way to projective stack. But now if I want to talk about complete intersections, I just need to extend the affine scheme to live in this bigger vector space. Um, and yeah, 
that LCI remark I made about Quasimus before is necessary here because sometimes this extension may not be LCI anymore, uh, which is why we kind of needed to get rid of that assumption. So the big kind of thing that you need to think about here is what is the action of this new larger torus on your bigger vector space? And the idea is that you really want to keep the action of the first C star to be exactly the same and act by zero on these extra factors in your vector space. And then you get some weight matrix where you kind of subdivide it as so. Basically, for each of the original coordinates, your torus acts by some specified weights that you explicitly compute depending on your class. I didn't write it down because I didn't want to put down too many uh, formulas, but essentially, given a class, you could compute what these weights have to, what, what these weights should be. You can kind of explicitly write these down, but you get some kind of sub matrix here uh, where you get some kind of twisting of these um, extra torus actions on your original coordinates. And then on the extra C and the extra coordinates coming from this extension, uh, you want your extra torus factors to act like the identity matrix. And this is going to be useful to kind of keep track um, by how much your, uh, well, okay, maybe that comment will make more sense later, but th this kind of identity matrix will be useful for keeping track of some data later on. And then to define kind of this extended affine scheme, you want to do kind of a similar construction. You have a vector bundle in a section. You really want to extend that vector bundle in section to this bigger space. The idea that you should think about is that on this, once you extend this larger vector space, your original section may no longer be quasi homogeneous with respect to these new uh, weight parameters. So maybe it was quasi homogeneous with respect to just the first row, but now that you added in all these extra factors, it may no longer be quasi homogeneous. So you need to homogenize it in a certain way. The choice of homogenization is, um, is that it's a choice, but we pick a choice that is, um, in my words, I would say minimal. It's, it's very much a choice that kind of preserves the collabialness of the hypersurface. Um, yeah, you can also pick different choices, but typically they're worse. And I can explain that more maybe if I have time at the end. So the main result is that if you manipulate your GIT in a certain way, like you have a choice of admissible classes, you have an explicit choice of manipulation of the GIT, then what you end up doing is that you can compute an I function out of this using C star localization. And once you compute this I function, you uh, get an I function that has, well, multiple Novikov parameters. I mean, it's uh, now you're going to have a Nova cog parameter for every C star factor that you originally had. And then um, what's more is that this I function you can put through Young's wall crossing theorem. And so what we show is that after you put this through Young's wall crossing theorem, you can invert the transformation or the change of coordinates that you originally saw. This kind of boils down to essentially saying if I have, uh, I, can, I can find an invertible ring homomorphism within these two kind of um, power series rings where Q0 to QM are these extra Novikov parameters that I get in my I function. And the other side, I have some formal parameters TI to TM, which you can think of as maybe the formal parameters in front of that choice of basis of admissible classes. And I've kind of written this here, but what you end up getting is that if I take a J function where my generic insertion is now something in the span of my chosen basis of admissible classes. Um, so if I pick something which is essentially a generic insertion in my admissible state space, then this I function using the wall crossing theorem gives you uh, this J function with this, um, with this insertion coming out of mu. So mu will end up having this type of term in it. But then conversely, because I can invert this ring homomorphism, I can instead rewrite this form of the J function where these are formal parameters as a change of coordinates on the I function. And because I can do that, then I can now kind of match parameters on both sides and pull out the individual invariants from the generating series. 
So really the upshot is now that if you change this GIT parameter in a specific way and compute a resulting I function, you can actually recover the Gromov weight invariance. And this is all independent of convexity. None of that comes into play here. So a few remarks, and then what I'm going to do is I want to do an example because I think that kind of illustrates the idea a bit more. Um, the remarks I want to say is that, well, I guess I've already said this, the invertibility, invertibility ensures the recovery of the individual Gromov invariance because I'm now getting explicit formula for uh, the formal series J itself rather than a formula for J after a change of coordinates have been applied to it. And then also because I'm choosing kind of a basis for my admissible state space and that admissible state space contains these ambient cohomology classes, essentially what happens is that we can compute all the invariants you would expect if quantum left shifts did hold. So if I were in a convex case and I could use quantum left shifts, then all those invariants that you would get, I can, uh, we can still compute um, using this kind of other method. Okay, so I was very loose on details. And part of that is because it's kind of just like a bunch of formulas and maybe not that enlightening. So what I wanted to do is I want to go through an example and kind of give you maybe some geometric motivation as to how we choose this GIT parameterization and maybe some idea of why it's able to recover these um, kind of invariants of admissible insertions in them. So the example that I want to pick is a very simple Calabria hypersurface. I want to take a way to project a space that's essentially a P4, um, but I make one of the coordinates have weight three instead of weight one. And then I take a degree seven hypersurface inside of that guy. This would be a Calabria. If you want a possible equation, it kind of looks something like this. Here's a possible equation F that you can take where, again, this X3 coordinate now has degree three. Um, you can check that all such equations, like the generic equation, will pass through this overfold point. So this hypersurface is still stacky. It still has a stack point in it. And you can also write X7 as a GIT quotient, again, by taking the vanishing of this F inside of the vector space defining the projective stack. Okay, so the inertia stack of X7 is going to look like X7 but it's also going to have two other components attached to it. And these two components are coming from the stackiness of that extra degree three point here. Each of these components looks like a stacky, it's a B mu three. So it looks like a point modulo a mu three action or this stack quotient. Um, and if you take the Chen-Ron cohomology of this, what you're going to get is the singular cohomology of X7 but then you're also going to get two extra cohomology classes coming from each of these BMU3s. And um, the first one is after you do this kind of Chen-Ron grading, will actually be a degree two class. The second one will be a degree four class. So I'm just going to focus on the degree two class because for some kind of dimension reasons, it turns out that when you're working with Calabria threefolds, you really only need to care about the degree two classes for the Gromov weight and invariance. So this one I'll ignore, um, and this is what we're going to put our focus on, this class that I'm going to call phi 1 over 3. Okay, so let me kind of explain why we do these GIT parameterizations and why they're kind of needed. So the first thing I want to recall is that the way you compute the I function is out of this kind of palm stack where you have a weighted projective line with one stacky point in it, and you map into this ambient stack quotient. However, one of the things that you can check directly using kind of a Riemann rock theorem is that convexity, these, this kind of failure convexity, really only starts appearing when the maps of, when the curves mapping into your space have more than one stacky point. If there's only one stacky point, then this convexity kind of just ends up looking like positivity, just like in the scheme case. And so you get this really weird thing going on where you know convexity doesn't hold on the gromov wooden side, but on the quasi map side, because you only have one stacky point, you can apply quantum left shifts. And so if you just compute the I function naively, you just compute it using kind of this very uh, standard GIT presentation, what ends up happening is that this I function doesn't actually capture the information of invariance with multiple insertions or the um, invariance that 
are involved in this kind of failure convexity, invariants that are computed from curves with multiple stacky points mapping into your target. So you're really only getting like a very small slice of the total invariants that you can compute. And quite frankly, not so much the interesting ones because you really care about the ones that you couldn't normally get before. So the problem that's here is that you want to get a more expressive I function, but to do that, I really need to have more stacky points inside of my source curves. And for reasons that are a bit technical, you can't just manually add in points into the definition of the I function. Um, for those who are familiar with the literature, it's the idea is that this is what's normally called a small I function, this computation. And I kind of want to compute things that a big I function would compute, but at least in orbital fold theory, orbital fold quasi map theory, there's no good notion of a big I function at the moment. Um, part of that is because we don't have a good notion of light points. Okay, so you need some other way to get around it. I can't just manually add stacky points, but there are there's a kind of a trick that you can do. And the trick is uh, so if I I want to let's say take an orbital curve. And let's say there's a stacky point B V of three in it. But if I let C bar be the underlying course curve or the scheme underlying this point, I can take the underlying points of the marking, let's say P. So you can think of B mu three as kind of like a third of P, but then I have P downstairs. And so I have a quasi map for my overhold curve into my ambient uh, stack quotient. Uh, and one thing I can ask is, is there a way that I can actually rewrite my quasi map so that they're coming from the course curve instead of the orbifold fold curve? If I can do that, then effectively I can destackify my curve. And so even a curve of a bunch of stacky points, I can rewrite it into this quasi map from a curve with no stacky points. And then I can still see the information up here in the I function. So here, really, if you take a curve from uh, if you take a map into a way to project a space, it's just like you would expect for um, for uh, projective space itself. Really, you have sections of some bundle that you choose on your curve. And here, I, I think I wrote down the data for P11113. So your first four sections are just sections of the bundle itself. But your third section, because it's degree three, it actually is going to live in a third power of your chosen line bundle. So this is kind of the equivalent data of what a quasi map from this stacky curve is into your target. So the big idea here is really that your orbifold curves can be thought about as root stacks. And as, um, you will, they can all be constructed using this kind of method of root stacks. Um, but what ends up happening is if you have root stacks, you can actually just rewrite your line bundles on root stacks in terms of line bundles from the course space. So because they're root stacks, if I take a line bundle on my course, on my orbital curve, I can rewrite it as the pullback of an honest line bundle from a line bundle on the course moduli scheme, tensored with some kind of root bundle uh, coming from the orbital structure. So this root bundle, you can think about it as taking like the line bundle associated with the visor p over three, it's a little bit imprecise to say that, but really you want to think of this root bundle as like, if in this case I had b mu three, but take a third power of it, it looks like I'm pulling back O of p from downstairs. So there's kind of this, this, this way to rewrite your overfold curves into this type of uh, decomposition. And it turns out that if you look at the cohomology of your overfold curves, then or the overfold line bundles, it's actually just the cohomology of the part that's coming from the course moduli space, this honest part downstairs. So one thing you can kind of see is if I wanted to rewrite this, I can I have this correspondence between HI of L and HI of curly L and HI of Roman L. And this lets me take sections of the honest line bundle downstairs. But here, if I look at curly L cubes, what happens is I get straight L cubes, but then this guy, this root bundle, once you cube it, will now be an honest line bundle, this kind of O of P pulled back from downstairs. So it's no longer straight L cubed itself. You're actually tensoring by some extra factor, this O of P. So if I wanted to define a quasi map from the course moduli space using this data, I kind of need to find a way to incorporate this O of P that is um, extra coming from the orbital structure. 
And so that's where the kind of idea of this weight matrix and this extended GAT is really coming into play here. The idea is really that I now include an extra torus factor. And by doing this, now if I take a quasi map into this GIT presentation, it's now the choice of two line bundles satisfying with some sections coming from, from um, some powers of these line bundles. And the way I choose my weight matrix is I want to choose it so that I kind of remember what powers I need. So in this case, uh, essentially I now have two bundles and here this kind of uh, curly L cubed in the cohomology, it had like this extra O of P action in it. So I want my second bundle to have, to kind of remember that O of P. It's a degree one bundle. So I have a degree, or I have a weight one action here. And then in the kind of general formula I had, I had this extra one to kind of correspond to the um, torus factor and the extra, extra coordinates that you get from this extension. And this one will be one just by our formula. Uh, but if I do this kind of presentation, the now choice of quality enough that I want to pick from the course curve is I pick two bundles, this honest L and this O of P. And now my sections, I really can choose sections from like the SI sections coming from the original quasi map now through these isomorphisms descends to sections of the uh, corresponding morphism you would have if you have these two bundles. And then the last section, this kind of extra one, you just pick it to be the tautological section of O of P and the tautological section of the kind of this extra bundle that you have. And so what you end up getting is you get a quasi map that agrees with the original one. So a quasi map from the course curve that agrees with the original one from the orbifold one. And what happens at the orbifold point is that um, if you think about kind of the, the GIT locus of this, the vanishing of the extra coordinates or like these vanishing of these, the kind of extra last coordinates, that's part of the unstable locus. And because I choose this last section to be kind of tautological, it basically says that at the point where the orbital fold structure should have been, I now have a point that maps outside of my uh, semi-stable locus. It's not mapping into the unstable locus. So this is now a point that blends into the ambient stack rather than the actual GIT stack portion. So effectively what I'm doing is I'm just taking an orbifold curve, I'm replacing it with its course moduli, and wherever their orbifold structure used to be, I'm now forcing it to kind of be these undefined base points, these points that are landing in the ambient stack instead. So I'm kind of taking all the data I want and I'm hiding it in the ambient stack rather than like, you know, using it in the, um, having it in the actual uh, map to the GIT stack quotients. So this is at least kind of the idea of how you end up picking these weights. Again, like I said, there are formulas in the paper, so you can kind of just do it all combinatorially as well. But at least when we were formulating it, this is kind of the geometry that we had in mind. Uh, I am running super low on time. Uh, do I have how many, like four minutes left, five minutes left, or? Uh, five or six minutes, don't panic. Five or Okay, okay. I, I, I kind of want, I wanted to touch on the work of Rachel uh, at some point, uh, and unfortunately, I'm kind of running a low on it, but I think I can get through it quickly. Um, so maybe, maybe it, I, I had an example of a non-ambient invisible class, um, so something that isn't pulled back from the course moduli. Maybe I'll leave this later if someone wants to ask afterwards and just move on to the kind of work of Rachel for a bit. Um, Oh, uh, yeah, like I said, all this actually holds for general complete interse intersections and toric stacks. Um, the biggest change that if you do this, though, is that in the Kalabi-Yau setting, we choose our extension such that once you extend it, uh, you still get a Kalabi-Yau um, kind of complete intersection in this kind of bigger stack quotient. In general, the kind of positivity of the tangent bundle of your extension really depends on what you're extending by. And it depends on the degrees of the classes you extend by. So if you extend by classes of degree greater than two, you get kind of more and more, your tangent bundle becomes more and more negative. And so what ends up happening is even if you are interested in like these Fano cases where things should be very nice, your mirror map should effectively be very simple. If you want to compute all the Grimov invariants, you want to compute these invariants with these insertions from these high degree classes, you still end up kind of putting yourself into a case where you're kind of similar to a general type hypersurface. Your mirror map now has a lot of positive powers of Z rather than having none. Um, 
Now, in this case, the invertibility theorem I wrote before, which is kind of like this ring isomorphism, that's not exactly what you have to do. What you end up kind of doing is you end up using the language that given tells Lagrangian cone, and you need to think about kind of a Birkhoff factorization argument to show that you can recover the individual chrome of invariance, but it's still doable. Um, so yeah, this is maybe just something there in case you are interested in doing complete intersections and towards stacks. But anyway, um, I wanted to touch a little bit on what I did with Rachel because I think this is also has a neat application. Um, so with Rachel, we actually took this and we applied it to non-abelian quotients. And the main idea is that Rachel has a paper about an abelian non-abelian correspondence. So how do I rewrite I functions coming from quotients where now instead of quotienting by a torus, I'm quotienting by a group that is not abelian. Um, I should say G should still be connected for technical reasons, but um, it doesn't have to be abelian anymore. And what Rachel's abelian on abelian correspondence does is that if you take an I function uh, of, if you want an I function of this kind of non abelian quotient, you can obtain it by modifying an I function from the corresponding abelian quotient. And by that, I mean you take a maximal subgroup of your, uh, a maximal torus of your group G, and you can kind of get another GIT quotient using this maximal torus instead. And so you compute an I function there, and you can use this kind of abelianization theorem to modify this to get an I function for the um, non-abelian quotients. So to be kind of precise, what's currently in the version of the paper, I actually think that we can maybe make it more general, but that's food for another day. Um, what we end up doing is that if you have uh, a wild group invariant element of your cohomology. So the wild group associated to this torus acts on your Chenron cohomology, and you can take classes of that Chenron cohomology that are invariant under the wild action. So yeah, it, it acts on the torus, uh, the, co the Chenron cohomology of the, the, the abelian quotient, and the wild invariant ones give you classes in the non-abelian quotient. But essentially what we say is that if you take the fundamental class of a wild invariant twisted sector, so you look at the inertia stack, there's also a wild group action on it. And you take the fundamental class of a sector that is actually fixed under that inertia stack, then you can actually do a similar GIT construction on the non-abelian side. And that I function that you get out of that still captures uh, chroma wind invariance with insertions coming from that wild invariant twisted sector. So, Basically, it's it, we're trying to explore like can you also do these GIT extensions to capture information for non-abelian quotients, and to some extent you can. So the main application that I wanted to go through, if you give me two more minutes, is essentially um, what motivated us was a conjecture by Onedo and Petracci about a computation of a quantum period for a Del Pezzo surface in a weighted Grassmannian. So I kind of written down the idea, the definition of the Del Pezzo right here. It's really, you have a Grassmannian construction, but you split your GL2 into kind of the SL2 part and the determinant part, and you want your determinant to act in a uh, weighted way on your space. So you can see here the determinant actually acts by like a third power on some of the coordinates. And this will actually end up giving you like a like you'll, you'll end up getting like a BMU three points inside of your uh, weighted Grossmannian coming from this guy. So uh, you can cut out a Del Pezzo surface out of this picking by picking a certain line bundle and this Del Pezzo will still be stacky. Um, so what Onedo Pajashi conjectured was that there should be a formula for the quantum period of this Del Pezzo surface. So the quantum period uh, the way I'll define it is as a specialization of the J function. So your J function is cohomology valued. And what you want to do is you want to take the coefficients of the J function that is uh, the unit class coefficients. So your, your you know, unit in your cohomology ring. But you want to pick the unit class coefficient of a J function where your generic insertion contains all classes of a certain degree. So you want the classes to be of a degree less than two, or at least twisted uh, unit classes of twisted sectors with degree less than two. So you pick a certain J function, you take a certain coefficient in it, that's the quantum period. And so 
uh, it turns out for the Del Peso surface, there's only one such class you really need to add as a generic insertion to your J function, and that one class actually is while invariant. So you can use this method to, instead of just computing the quantum period, you can compute the entire J function itself. And that's essentially what we do. We compute an I function of this kind of GIT extended by this extra class. We use the non-abelian abelian correspondence to get a I function for the uh, Del Peso surface. We use the wall crossing formula to show that you get a formula for the J function. And then you just specialize according to this kind of procedure you need in order to pull out the quantum period from the J function. And so what we do is actually show a little bit more of the conjecture of states. Um, the way Onedo Petrachi's conjecture is stated is that they, they have a formula for a specialized version of the quantum period. We actually recover a full quantum period, and we show that if you specialize it at a, a specific point, you get Onedo Petrachi's construction. And uh, so, yeah, it, it pretty much agrees. Um, the reason I bring this up as a, as a nice application is because there's a bigger program going on with uh, these overflow Del Pezos and these quantum periods relating them to something known as classical periods. And I guess the people who know more about this conjecture are the people who formulated it are really here. So uh, yeah, there is a regularized quantum period, which we can compute because we have the quantum period. There's a classical period that's computable via some program by the people in the audience. So maybe they can speak more about that. And then the conjecture is that these two are equivalents. Um, that part we haven't actually shown because none of us are, neither of us are, are maybe as familiar enough with, with actually showing the relationship between the two being the same. Uh, we kind of, I, like, I think I ended up computing by hand like the first like five or six coefficients and show that they actually do agree. And um, Rachel might have asked someone to do it in a computer, I think, and it seems like it agrees for higher terms as well. But you know, an actual proof to show that they agree is not yet there. So that's something that Rachel and I are kind of considering doing in the future, like showing these two are actually the same. But yeah, that's an application of kind of these computations, but now applied to non-abelian quotients. And I've gone five minutes over my time, so I'm just going to stop there and take any questions. Thank you.